Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Has anyone been to a, another presentation by Paul Kimia? Yeah. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> uh, but tonight we have the history of um, Lake Slayman Gang with Paul Kavia. Um, Mr. Kavia has written four books. Two of them are on the Purple Game, which was our first presentation here. He also did a presentation on the um, organized uh, the mafia in Detroit. So, without further ado, Mr. Paul Kavia, who will give us a break. Thank you, sir. So alive. Alive. Yeah, you must never know <laughs> what tomorrow brings. Hello, everybody, and thanks for coming tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, tonight, we're, I'm here to speak about the Legs Layman Gang. Uh, a number of you have heard my lecture on the Purple Gang. For those of you who haven't, I'd like to uh, emphasize the fact that Detroit was a wild, wild place during the 20s. Wild. It was the fourth largest city in the United States, and I think it was worse than Chicago or New York. Chicago and Al Capone, who got a lot of media attention. Detroit had the Purple Gang, but Detroit had all kinds of other gangs that specialized in all kinds of things. Uh, the Purple Gang were kind of freelancers. They controlled, they ruled the roost in the, in the Detroit underworld in the late 20s, and that's saying something, because the Detroit underworld in the late 20s was extensive and tough. The Purples controlled things in the Detroit underworld. When I say ruled, it, they controlled everything. Anybody who operated anything substantial, that was a money-making venture, whether it was gambling operations, whether it was drugs, whether it was extortion, anything that was making serious money, the Purple Gang got some of that money, they got some of it kicked back to them, or they put you out of business permanently. And they were very effective for a period of about five years, uh, mostly because the public was terrified to testify against anybody who the newspapers called a reputed Purple Gangster in open court. Uh, Detroit had many other gangs during that period of time. Detroit was unusual in, in the history of the U.S. underworld, and everybody had a specialty here. The Purples were kind of uh, overall a uh, protective organization for underworld characters that were doing things that, that paid them off. Then you had gangs like the Jaworski Gang, which specialized in safe cracking and bank robbery. And the Lehman Gang that specialized in robbing wise guys, stealing, actually kidnapping other gangsters and holding them for ransom. It was really a, a very good deal for a while because police really didn't care much about gangsters kidnapping other gangsters. The public didn't get too excited about it. Uh, what they were basically doing is kidnapping very well-to-do gambling operators. How many people here are aware of the fact that during the Prohibition era, actually from the turn of the 20th century to about 1940, Wayne County and Macomb County had wide open illegal gambling. <coughs> gambling was illegal, of course, but uh, everybody was turning a blind eye to it because they were getting nice paychecks from it. Uh, Detroit was like, you could almost call it the Las Vegas of the Midwest in the 20s. There were gambling casinos all over, everything from alley crap games to elaborate roadhouses where they had name entertainment and people wore formal clothes. It was wide open. Mount Clemens, Detroit, the whole area. These guys, the Lehman Gang, specialized in kidnapping other gangsters. And this, this actually all evolved in the mid-20s with a St. Louis gangster named Johnny Reed. Johnny Reed was a Purple Gang liquor <coughs> distributor, a very powerful gangster in his own right. He was from St. Louis. He was a former Egan's Rat, which was the Purple Gang of the St. Louis area during the 20s. He came here about 1925, and he did, he did some work for the Purple Gang, but him and some of his co-partners uh, organized the first kidnapping mob that later became named, known as the Lehman Gang. Uh, this, this mob had all kinds of different names, but in the early days it was called the, the, the uh, Burke Newberry O'Reardon mob. Reed was killed in 1926. He was murdered by uh, a shakedown artist that he threw out of his blind pig that took exception to it and hired somebody to come from out of town and kill him, but that's a different story. But anyway, that mob was basically, after, after those guys were gone, Burke, how many people here are familiar with Fred Killer Burke? His real, his real name was Thomas Camp. He was a college graduate, by the way. He was a freelance gunman that worked out of St. Louis with uh, a guy named Gus Winkler. He also worked with 
another guy named Milford Jones. These were some of the most notorious gangsters of the 20s. These guys formed a little group that went around to various cities and offered their services to like the Capone organization and New York gangsters. Uh, they were freelance hitmen, and they, in their spare time, they robbed banks, big time bank robberies. Well, Fred Killer Burke was part of this original kidnapping mob, the Lehman Gang. The gang was actually named after Joseph, and they called him Legs. That was his street name because his legs seemed out of proportion with the rest of his body. Lehman. <laughs> Lehman was a career criminal. He was born in 1900 in Detroit uh, and kind of had a sad background, uh, as probably a lot of these underworld characters did. Uh, he was born in 1900. The mother, his mother divorced in 1907 when he was just seven years old. He was put into an orphanage because she couldn't take care of the kids, him and his brother. Uh, they were in an orphanage for five years, and then he was sent to Boys Republic. Many people here familiar with that? Yeah. He yeah. was a delinquent. Yeah. Well, when he was 15, they released him and he went home and his mother had remarried and his second husband didn't want anything to do with the kids. So basically from the time he was 15, he was on his own. Now, for a while, he did legitimate things. He drove a truck for a while. He was a structural steel worker. And in the 1920s, he kind of, kind of slid into hijacking, bootlegging, that kind of stuff. Lots of people did that. It was an easy way to make a lot of money. Uh, he got hooked up with this gang at that time, like I said, Joseph Fred O'Reardon. He was another Irish gangster. This guy was actually a graduate pharmacist that ran a pharmacy, and he worked in pharmacies around Detroit. But he was the brains behind the Lehman mob during their most successful period. He was never actually involved directly in the kidnappings, but he'd set them up. Uh, the, actually, 1927, the mob took in over $300,000 in 1927 dollars, if you can figure out how much that is. Many millions of dollars in today's money. Kidnapping wealthy gangsters. And typically what they would do is they'd kidnap these guys, and they'd hold them for ransom, and they would call their family and tell them, you know, they would have them write a note and say, I'm kidnapped, you know, and the gang wants $100,000 from my release, or otherwise they're going to kill me, or they're going to torture me, or they're going to do something heinous to me. So anyway, what they would do is they start out with $100,000, and they gave them lots of leeway, lots of uh, negotiating power. Typically, they ended up with five or $10,000 ransom which again was a lot of money. I mean, they asked $100,000, they knew they weren't gonna, nobody was gonna come up with $100,000 cash in 1927, even a wealthy gambler. Uh, that's how they started out. And they were very effective at that for a while, the police didn't bother them. I don't think anybody really cared that they were kidnapping gamblers or, or underworld characters. And the idea originally Johnny Reed came up with before he was killed was that if you kidnapped underworld characters, they wouldn't go to the police. He usually didn't go to the police. They got the ransoms, everything was clean, they kidnapped these guys, and then they released them. It's interesting that they never kidnapped the same guys twice. If the guys paid the ransom once, they usually left them alone. Now, that wasn't always the case, but most of the time. But this gang evolved through a number of different changes and a number of different people running it. It was known as the Legs Lehman Gang. And Joseph O'Reardon, again, this pharmacist who was from St. Louis, who had a kind of interesting history, too, O'Reardon grew up with a lot of guys who later became members of the Egan's Rats mob in St. Louis. Uh, he kind of, I mean, he, at least on the surface, appeared to go straight. He finished high school. He went to college, which was very unusual for somebody in the early part of the 20th century. And he was a licensed pharmacist. But he grew up with guys like Gus Winkler, who were part of the, uh, the, the, this freelance group of hitmen that walk, went around from city to city and offered their services to various organized crime groups. Uh, he grew up with... Uh, Milford Jones. Milford Jones is interesting in his own right. Between 1923 and 1926, I counted 150 arrests of this guy in St. Louis alone. 150 arrests. For everything, from petty larceny to rape to murder to kidnapping, bank robbery. And I think the most time he did was maybe a week. So tell me that somebody wasn't on the payroll. <laughs> anyway. This, guy, this group started out as a very notorious, notorious group of gangsters, mostly out-of-state gangsters. Lehman was a local gangster. O'Reardon you know, lived here after he moved from St. Louis. <coughs> so they continued to operate. They continued to, to kidnap underworld characters. And then they made a mistake. They started to get greedy. The first major problem, and probably the thing that, that really killed the Lehman gang, was they started kidnapping legitimate people. In 1929, <laughs> This kidnapping gang had gotten so big, and so many people, there was so much fear in the community 
of these people kidnapping wealthy people that they actually put together a task force, the Michigan State Police and the Detroit Police, to eliminate the kidnapping gangs. There were other gangs, but not, not, nobody quite as notorious as the Lehman Mob. Well, they kidnapped a young son of a guy named Gerson Cass, who was a very wealthy real estate operator in Detroit. The son was 23 years old, and he was a degenerate gambler. He also, he also was kind of a, a financier of a couple of blind pigs, so he was sort of mixed up in the underworld. Well, the kidnapping gangs, they had, uh, they were fairly well organized, especially the layman mob, and they had uh, a group of different people who were, were named different things. For example, if they kidnapped somebody and they tortured them, they had different names for the torturing techniques. Sometimes they called, they called putting a cigar behind someone's ear or burning them, toasting. Huh. They plucked their eyebrows out and called that plucking. Or they, they might hit them, they, what they used to call fancy shooting, they tie them to a post and shoot at them, see how close they could come without wounding them. The idea being that if the person was hard-nosed and didn't want to negotiate for a ransom, they wanted to scare them. Well, this was a very effective way of scaring them. Anyway, typically what would happen is somebody would grab these guys, grab whoever they were going to kidnap the target. The target would be picked out by what they called the finger man. This was usually a guy who ran a blind pig. How many people know what a blind pig is? They know where the term comes from? Sure. Okay. Blind pig was just a speakeasy in Detroit. And a lot of these gangsters, they did lots of things. They sold drugs. They kidnapped people. Uh, they extorted money from people, and they ran blind pigs. It was a great way to make easy money during the provision. There were like 25,000 blind pigs in Detroit in 1925, and that's a conservative estimate. From 1,800 licensed saloons before prohibition. But anyway, what would happen is somebody who ran a blind pig would get to know these characters, would get to know, you know, they get drunk and they start talking about their personal finances, so they know who had money and who didn't have money. So they were the fingermen. They'd point them out to the game. Then they would get guys that were pickup men. Now, Legs Lehman started out as a pickup man. What they would do is they would find uh, the person, they would follow the person for a while, find out what their habits were, and then grab them, throw a bag over their head. Usually they have masks on, be at dusk. They grab them, throw a bag over their head, take them, you know, make them get in, make them go and the, drive their car to wherever they had their, the, the kidnappers had their car parked, and they get them in the car, they lay them on the back seat, then they take their masks off, and they take them to what they call the castle. This was the place where they held these kidnapping, pr kidnapped prisoners. Uh, they'd have somebody at the castle they'd call the keeper. This is the person who would prepare food for these guys, make sure they stayed chained up, and make sure they stayed blindfolded. And then they had another gang member who would usually do the ransom negotiations. They call him the voice. The, the kidnapped person would never see this person. He would just hear him talk to them. Then they would have a guy that was the intermediary who would communicate with the family. The kidnappers were never seen by the family of the kidnapped person. And they called this person the right old guy. And this was either a guy, this was usually another gangster, or maybe it was a business associate of some of the wise guys that they originally started to kidnap. And this was the person who did the, the mediation between the family and the kidnappers and brought the ransom to the kidnappers, and this person would get paid off, and they'd get their ransom, and then they release their prisoner. That's how it was supposed to go. But anyway, with this cast kidnapping, it was kind of the beginning of the end for the Lehman gang. They kidnapped this 23-year-old kid, and they were supposed to meet Gerson Cass. They, again, they negotiated a $25,000 ransom to release his son. It ended up being $5,000. So he was supposed to meet him on Chicago Boulevard and start walking west towards Linwood. Anybody here familiar with those neighborhoods? Okay. This was in July 1929. And somebody was going to walk up to Gerson Cass and say the number eight. Just say eight in his ear, and he was supposed to hand him the ransom money. Well, the guy who was doing that was Legs Lehman. Well, anyway, somehow the police found out. Gerson Cass never contacted the police. He was scared to death that they would kill his son if he did. Somehow the police got word of it. Somebody tipped him off. Maybe he might have been another gang member. Might have been a kidnapping gang member. I don't know. Somebody was out to get Lehman. Well, anyway, he went to pick up the ransom. He, uh, and there were Detroit police set up. Four or five detectives had been set up in the area, and they were watching. They saw Lehman go up to Cass, whisper the number eight in his ear, and take the money. As soon as they took the money, they came out of hiding. Lehman took off running, and they opened fire. Uh, it's kind of interesting today that we have the ancestors of Legs Lehman right here in this room. That's his stepson. 
and these are his two granddaughters. <laughs> <laughs> They're nice, legitimate people. They don't kidnap anybody. You know, they left all, all the artillery in the car. <laughs> but anyway, uh, they, they shot Lehman. He got shot in the back. One, actually, one of the detectives was actually laying on the lawn of Sacred Heart Seminary. They all opened fire as he took off running. They shot him in the back, and he actually close to his spine. And he was paralyzed temporarily. At first, uh, you know, he was in the hospital. He wasn't going to talk. First, he said he did it all by himself. First, he said he was picking up the money because uh, a bootlegger had told him that this guy owed him money, and he'd give him a cut if he'd go and collect it. Then he told him that he kidnapped uh, Cass on his own, and that there was no gang, there was nobody involved in it. And then, of course, it was obvious that he didn't. So, you know, he wouldn't talk. So they figured, you know, the gang panicked at this point, and they took Cass out into a field. Two guys, uh, a guy by the name of Hoffer and another guy by the name of Wiles. These were gunmen that worked for the Lehman gang. They took him to a field in Lapeer, and they took him out. And uh, I don't know, he asked them what they were going to do. He was blindfolded. They walked him out into this field. And uh, one of them hit him with a pistol whipped him, but broke his jaw, and he fell down on the ground, and they all emptied their pistols into his kit. They panicked. Well, anyway, of course, there was a huge uproar in the city. I mean, he, he initially was, they didn't know this right away. They didn't find the body for five months, and then they couldn't really identify the body because they found it by the Flint River in Lapeer. And the body was so decomposed at that time that they had to do check dental records and they, to find out that this had been cast and that these two gunmen had both shot him. Well, anyway, Hoffer and Wiles, that's another story. But this gang was made up of probably about 20 gangsters. Sometimes they worked together as a group, and sometimes they just worked together as in threes, fours, and, five, <coughs> and fives. Layman generally worked with a guy named Henry Andrews, who was one of the keepers of the castles in Dearborn, this, this particular house. Uh, there was a bootlegger that had been kidnapped by the gang. A lot of this stuff kind of unraveled in 1929 named Fred Begeman. He was a Wyandotte bootlegger, a very successful rum runner during Prohibition, who got out of it before he got killed or ended up going to prison. Well, anyway, they figured this guy had a lot of money. And uh, they ambushed him in his driveway. He was washing his car one April day, threw a bag over his head, toted him off, threw him in a car, took him someplace. They took him to this, whole, this house in Dearborn. Well, when they, when they arrested Lehman, it gave the guy the courage to come forward and tell him what happened. And they had arrested him. <coughs> and uh, Lehman went to the Detroit police and told them that Lehman had been involved in this kidnapping and that he was in a house in Dearborn. And he said he thinks he could identify the house because what they, would, they did is they chained him to a bed in the attic. <coughs> And they had boarded up a window, but there was a board missing from the top, and somehow he could see a church spire through that board, through his blindfold, and a green roof. So the police identified it as St. Alphonsus Catholic Church in Dearborn. And uh, somehow, with Begeman, they figured out where the location was. They broke into the house, and they arrested Henry Andrews, who was a partner of Joe Lehman, and his wife. And they actually took Begeman up to the room and put him in the bed. He had stretched himself out, went through the same, same things he was doing, and showed him some, some scribbling that he did on the wall. So he proved beyond a doubt that he had been kidnapped by him. And he said that Legs Lehman had been one of the kidnappers. He said he didn't see him, but he, he recognized his voice, that it held a cocked pistol to his head and forced him to write a ransom note. Well, anyway, Lehman at this time, of course, is still in the hospital recuperating from his wound. He goes to recorder's court. He's tried for extortion. They couldn't get enough at that time. This was like July 1929. They didn't know what happened to the cast, uh, the young cast kid. They didn't know he had been killed at that time. So they could only try him for extortion because he picked up the ransom money. Well, during the whole trial, Lehman just kind of laughed and smirked and yawned and you know looked up at the ceiling. And the judge lectured him, and the judge kept saying, you know, I know you know more about this than you. I don't know anything. Just kept smiling. Well, anyway, they gave him maximum for extortion, which was two years. So he went to prison, and as he walked out, the judge again said, I know you can tell us a lot more about this than you're willing to tell him. He just turned around, big smile on his face, and walked out. So he's being a stand-up guy. He was going to go to prison. He wasn't going to say anything to anybody. In the meantime, there were some other freelance gunmen that were operating from the Lehman gang. One group was made out of this Hoffer and Wiles. 
and another gangster named Andrew Germano. Uh, one of the castles, one of the places where they held kidnapped victims was in Toledo. Around that same time in July, they got a tip that Germano was in this apartment. Uh, Detroit police and Toledo police officers busted into this apartment and got Germano. They were trying to get Germano for the cast kidnap, and Cass said he did. Of course, he didn't know anything about it. He said uh, he'd only robbed a few banks and might have shot a few police officers, but he didn't know anything about the kidnapping. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, they busted into the apartment and caught this guy. He had three guns on him. I mean, he was that heavily armed in the apartment. Well, anyway, they took him back to Detroit. It ends up that him and Hoffer and another gangster in 1929, these guys all met Henry Andrews. If you, It's kind of confusing because there's a lot of people involved in this. Henry Andrews was part of the Lehman gang. He was a partner of Legs Lehman. Henry Andrews was in prison for auto theft in the mid-20s, and he met this Wiles and this Hoffer in Jackson. Okay, so when these guys got out, they kind of got together, and they became part of the Lehman gang. Well, Wiles and Hoffer, they had their uh, other agenda. Uh, for example, this is one that I, I think is really interesting. In April of 1929, there was a Pontiac, Michigan doctor and his wife. They pulled into their driveway in the evening. I guess they were coming home from a show or going out to dinner. And Hoffer and Wiles were waiting behind their garage and they stepped out with guns and they relieved them of their car. They carjacked them. They didn't hurt them. They just told them to get out of the car. They took the car. They took the car and they drove up to Flint, Michigan. They tried to rob a bank. Got involved in a shootout with the Flint police. Got away in the same car. Drove back through Ann Arbor. So they're driving around in Ann Arbor at 2 o'clock in the morning. In the Ann Arbor police see these, actually there's another guy in the car with them. And they see these three guys who obviously didn't look like they belonged in Ann Arbor. And, and pulled them over and asked them what they were doing. And they explained that they were lost and they were trying to find their way back to the train. But there's something about the way they looked that the, the cop didn't buy. So he told his partner to follow him to police headquarters. And he's standing on the running board of the car. So they're going along on their way to Ann Arbor Police Headquarters. All of a sudden, this car takes off, takes a quick turn. Somebody in the back seat of the car sticks an automatic pistol into this cop's belly and fires it four times. And then shoots him in the chest, and they take a quick turn, and the cop falls out the car. The only thing that saved his life was he had a bulletproof vest on. For the first time he ever wore one that night. <laughs> so anyway, these guys take off again. And they're on their way back to Detroit. So they're out, they're coming down Franklin Road. I don't know, maybe they were drunk. And they flipped the car over on a rock formation and really banged up, banged themselves up. They could walk, they could move. So they hitchhiked to Birmingham. <laughs> All three of these guys, they hitchhiked to Birmingham and they go up to a Birmingham police officer named Henry Mildebrandt, who was happened to be standing there. And they said, could you get us a cab? And he sees these guys, and they're all bleeding, and they're bruised, and they're bandaged up. <laughs> and he says, what happened to you guys? You know, he says, well, we were in a traffic accident. We're just trying to get back to Detroit. OK, so he waves the cab down, and the cab comes up. And these guys all get into the cab. And he says, take us to police headquarters. Of course, this is not where these guys want to go. So they're going to file an accident report. So on their way to police headquarters, Germano pulls out a gun, shoots the cop in the arm. They push both of these people out of the car. They take off in, this, in the cab. Later on that, that evening, they find the cab at Naren Lake in the Lake Orion area, submerged. The woman said that she saw these three guys get out of this car and get into another car and go back to Detroit. So on their way back, I guess they needed some, some spending money. They stuck up a, a grocery store. This is all one night. <laughs> and this is what they're dealing with. These are cowboys. <laughs> Wiles and, and Hoffer decided that they wanted to kidnap a very well-to-do music a guy who owned a music store, a guy named William Gunn. So they just walked up to his house one afternoon in broad daylight and said, you know, is your husband home? So his wife went to get him. They pulled guns out and they said, come on, you're going with us. You're going to take a ride. And I guess gun panicked and grabbed one of them, got the gun away from the other one. The other one just casually reached over his shoulder and shot him twice in the stomach. Gun died. These guys took off again. Uh, again, these guys are still out there freelancing around. The Hoffer and Wiles are the two guys who actually killed the young Cass kid. So they're planning another holdup. So this time, this is the same guys again. They run a room and they kidnap the son of a guy that Hoffer used to work for, who owned a, a restaurant in Detroit. He was a fairly wealthy restaurant owner named Matthew Holdreth. Holdreth was taking his kid brother back to Notre Dame, and he was coming back from Ohio, from Indiana, I guess. And uh, Wiles called the house and said, when's he going to be home? I'm a friend of his, you know, we're supposed to go out. He says, well, he'll be home about 8 o'clock. So those two guys were waiting for him. 
So he comes home, they put a bag over this kid's head, and they kidnap him. <laughs> so they take him to the room, they, lie, they, 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 they chain him to the bed, they handcuff him, and they disappear. They have him write a ransom note, and they disappear. Well, in the meantime, they tell his father that they negotiate for a ransom, so they're going to give him, he's going to pay $5,000 for his son to be ransomed in $20 bills, and he's going to meet him at Grand River and Telegraph. So these guys said, on Saturday night, at 8 o'clock, I want you to get in your car with the ransom money and start driving very slowly out Grand River to Telegraph. And when you get to Telegraph, there's going to be a car that's going to pull up next to you. We're going to throw the keys and his identification, his wallet, through the window so you know it's us. And then you can just throw the ransom money. Well, anyway, they didn't have a car. So he starts going out there, and these, these two guys, they, pick, they get a cab. Detroit taxi cab. <laughs> so this cab picks him up at 12th Street and Grand Boulevard, and uh, they said he wanted to go out to Ferndale. So they go out to Ferndale and they go someplace where there was a lot that they knew that was vacant. They beat the cab driver, threw him out of the cab, and took off in the cab. <laughs> Tied him up so he couldn't get it, you know, hopefully give him enough time to get away with the cab. So they get on the stolen cab and they're going out to meet Holder's father at Grand River and Telegraph. So they go out to meet Holder's father. In the meantime, this guy's rolling around in the weeds in this vacant lot. He gets loose and calls the Detroit police. They get the ransom from Holder's father. They throw the wallet through the window, and they're coming back down Grand River. So they got the ransom money, and these, the two gangsters and another one, another guy that they were working with was in the car. And they just happened to go by a Detroit police scout car that had a radio in it, which was rare in those days. Well, they had you know, they knew there was a cab stolen, they knew the license number of the cab, so these guys see these guys whip down Grand River in front of them, so they take out after them. They end up getting in a shootout where there's about 50 or 100 shots in state. One of the guys that was riding in the back got shot up pretty bad and got away. The other two, Offer and Wiles, were arrested. <clears throat> and they were trying to, again, they were trying to convict them, they were trying to pin the cast kidnapping on them. So all this stuff is going on. Layman goes to Jackson Prison. And this task force, a couple of the detectives from this police task force are working on Lehman to trying to get him to testify against the mob, trying to get him to say who was involved in the cast kidnapping, who are these guys, just name them, and you know, you're going to get a reduction in your sentence. Well, of course, he wouldn't talk. So when they finally found the body of the cast, young cast, and they positively identified that Hoffer and Wiles had been there, actually, these guys. Of all things, I think is interesting is ballistics was just coming into the public attention. Of those people here familiar with ballistics, mm -hmm. you know, rifling and a gun. It's like fingerprints on the shells. Well, anyway, they they had two slugs that they took out of the the decomposed body of of, of young David Cass. Were these these shells were actually these were bullets that were fired from the guns, and these guys kept their guns. You think they throw them away? So they tied the guns directly to the murderers, and they threw the both of these guys from <coughs> shots into this young cast. So anyway, they, okay, uh, Germano, by that time, had already been tried for shooting this Birmingham, Michigan cop in the arm, remember in Birmingham, and uh, he was given 45 to 50 years in Marquette, so he was already in prison. So they didn't do much with that, but they put... Hoffer was tried, he was convicted, he also got 45 to 50 years, he went to Marquette. This is in the end of their story now. Now Hoffer's in Marquette, and Wiles is in Marquette, and Andrew Germano's in Marquette. It's 1931, uh, Lehman had already testified by this time, but anyway, this is just a kind of an aside. Probably one of the worst, if not the worst, prison riot in, in Michigan correctional pr history, Marquette riot of August of 1931. Wiles was sick. He had kidney problems and he died. And he told the doctor that if he died, his boys were going to get him. Well, anyway, somehow they smuggled guns into the prison to uh, Germano and two other convicts that were up there in canned chicken. They actually had a tinsmith that opened up these cans of chicken and put guns in. In those days, you could order food like that if you were in Marquette Prison or in Jackson Prison. Well, anyway, these guys hit guns. Hoffer died, uh, Hoffer died, Wiles died. Andrew Germano and this other guy show up at the sick call on August 27, 1931, in the clinic at Marquette. And the doctor's name was Hornbogen. He was relieving for the doctor that was on vacation. And he asked, 
Germano to take off his shirt. Well, Germano had a pistol stuck in his belt. He didn't want to take off his shirt, so he insisted he take off his shirt. He took off his shirt, he pulled out the gun, he shot the doctor dead right there. Uh, a trustee that was in a hospital jumped on him and wrestled around with him, and the other guy that was with Germano <laughs> pulled his gun out and shot the trustee and killed him. So they took off down the stairs. They ran out, they grabbed the guard, and they ran out into the prison yard. And that's before firing a couple shots at the warden, who happened to be down there talking to the deputy warden, because these guys ran by. So they were chasing the guard. The guard broke and ran away from him, and, the guy, and I guess the guards on the wall started firing at him to keep him from grabbing this guard. They ran to the prison industries building with another guard, captured, caught another guard, and had a shootout with state police and the Marquette police. So over 100 police officers involved in the shooting. And uh, finally, late in the afternoon, it was kind of a stalemate. Germano threw a note out and said he wanted the warden to come in his personal car and take them through the gate. The warden answered with tear gas, so these guys all committed suicide. Germano shot himself in the head, the other two convicts killed themselves. This is August 1931. Anyhow, this is just an aside, just to show you some of these characters. Lehman, uh, Lehman's wife was left destitute when he went to prison, and part of the agreement of the gang was they were going to take care of everybody. They were going to take care of the families of any member that went to prison to take that whole load off of them, that whole stress load. This way you don't have to run anybody out. Your family's going to be taken care of. Well, they didn't take care of his family. His family was left destitute. Uh, supposedly, uh, Red O'Riordan was supposed to take care of him. He didn't. So the police were working on Lehman, working on Lehman, trying to get him to talk, telling him, you know, they left your family destitute, your wife's on relief, your, your kids are going to be starving. And Henry Andrews, in the meantime, he, he turned state's witness. He became a state witness. And when Lehman found out that Andrews, his, his good buddy, had become a state witness, he figured, what do I got to lose? So he became a state witness, too. He went back and testified against the remnants of the Lehman gang at that time. Almost every one of those guys ended up getting very lengthy prison terms. Lehman's term was cut considerably. At first, he had, I think he was 40 to 50 years for kidnapping. And they reduced his sentence to 10 to 20 years, and he got out in five years. Got out in 1935. At that time, Harry Bennett, who ran the Ford Service Department, everybody here is familiar with the Ford Service Department. Yep. With the Ford Service Department's history, it was a it was an employment bureau for gangsters, pretty much. Most, <laughs> most, most yeah, it could be another type. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but Harry Bennett, you know, Ford was determined to keeping the union out, the UAW out of Ford in the mid 30s, but when all the organizing was going on. So they hired gangsters. They hired former gangsters. They hired thugs. They hired professional fighters. They hired wrestlers. Anybody with a reputation as being tough. And Bennett sat on the parole board, so he gets Lehman out of prison. And he gets Lehman in his office, and he says, you know, he says, the only reason I got you out is because you could have killed me one night, and you didn't do it. So what had happened was, during this cast kidnapping, the father knew that Harry had, had a friend that knew Harry Bennett, knew Harry Bennett had very good connections with the Detroit underworld because he hired all these gangsters. He knew all these guys. So he figured that maybe Bennett would be able to figure out what's going on with the kidnappers, what, what they're going to do with his kid, how he's going to get, you know. Well, anyway, Bennett said he'd see what he could do. And he was on his way home one night, as he tells the story, and he saw a, a car, he thought it was policemen, parked at a, at a rendezvous where they usually waited for bootleggers to drive by. Well, anyway, it was a policeman. Legs Lehman happened to be in this touring car with three other guys. And it was dark, and he pulled up, and he said he had a, a funny feeling about it because I guess the, car, the lights in the car were on, and the car was just sitting there idling. And when he pulled up, the lights went out. So he thought, uh-oh. So he ducked, and I guess the windshield got blown out by a shotgun blast. So he got out of the car, and, and Legs Lehman gets out of the other car and walks up to him. And he's carrying a 12-gauge shotgun. He hits him with the butt of the shotgun knocks him down and puts a shotgun on his chest. So as Bennett says, he says, I talked like 10 lawyers for what seemed like forever, but couldn't have been more than five minutes. And Lehman finally took the gun off of me and walked away. Got back in the car and they left. So he said, the only reason I got you out of prison early is you could have killed me that night and you didn't. And Lehman looked at him and said, oh no. He said, there'd been another slug in the gun, you'd have got it. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Uh, Bennett said there was a long pause in the conversation after that. But he did work for the Ford Service Department for a number of years. Um, in fact, his stepson here, Donald, told me that I guess part of the deal was if you were a big enough named gangster, they actually gave you a car. They gave him a 35 Ford, a new 35 Ford, when he went to work for the company. So it wasn't a bad deal. Prime uh, pays. <laughs> but between Lehman and, and, Harry, and Henry Hall, and Henry Andrews, and uh, another Lehman gangster by the name of uh, Stanley DeLong. DeLong was the guy who usually did the voice part. He, he would talk to the, he would negotiate with the, the captive person. He posed as a Ferndale, Michigan barber, but he was one of the leading members of the gang. Now, O'Reardon, Joseph Red O'Reardon, the guy who was the brains behind most of these kidnappings, he was in Los Angeles by this time. Him and his wife took off. He claimed he had to go out west for her health. So he was under the radar for a while, and they picked him up by accident in 1933 in a public enemy sweep in Los Angeles. And I guess they sent his, pick, his fingerprints over the teletype, and they got this frantic message back from Detroit. We've been looking for this guy for five years. So he was extradited back to Detroit, and he stood trial for the kidnapping of, a boot, of actually a blind pig operator named Abe Fine in 1927. They kidnapped this guy as he's coming out of a restaurant after eating breakfast. Uh, it was it was Reardon, uh, Fred Keller Burke, and Milford Jones. And they kidnapped him and they held him for ransom. That was a successful ransom payoff. And of course, when all of this stuff was coming down, Fine testified that these were the guys who indeed did kidnap him. And he was given 15 to 35 years in Marquette. This was in 1934, but that essentially closed the door on the Lehman gang, but actually it was Legs Lehman and Henry Andrews and Stanley DeLong who ratted out the gang. It's interesting when they were in court, uh, Lehman was saying that when he saw Henry Andrews' statement, he said, he just figured what the hell, what, what, what's the use? I might as well just testify. He says, I turned rat. So Edward Kennedy Jr., who was a big time criminal attorney at that time, no relation to the Kennedy dynasty, uh, said, you know, why do you consider yourself a rat? And Lehman said, yeah, I, yes, sir, I consider myself a rat. And the judge says, what is, what's a rat? He says, it's an underworld term. He says, anybody who squawks, and I'm squawking. So, like I say, he ended up putting most of these guys away. It's kind of interesting. I was able to talk to the family about what happened to them in later years. You always wonder about these guys. Most of them never lived to be very old. Most of them were either killed in the process of being gangsters or died in prison. But he just lived a kind of low-key, under the radar, under the radar for the rest of his life. His stepson said he liked to move a lot because he thought people were after him. But I don't think they were. I think most of them were put away by that time. But it was actually the testimony of Layman Andrews and DeLong that closed the door on this whole kidnapping gang, this kidnapping era. And like I say, when they were kidnapping wise guys, they were very successful at it because nobody really paid that much attention. I even understand, and I don't know how true it is, but I always think that whenever you hear a rumor, there's always a kernel of truth in it. Uh, I was told by somebody who knew somebody who was a police detective back in the 20s and early 30s and said they had uh, a star chamber, that they had a group of detectives that went around and got rid of problem gangsters. I believe they probably did. You know. Of course, nobody's going to ever be able to prove that, but, uh, you know, yeah. They, in fact, one of the... Uh, police superintendents, a guy named Patrick O'Grady. When he was a homicide detective, he was known for, you know, grabbing a, 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 a problem, a problem gangster, and saying, oh, I'm going to give you a break this time, I'm going to let you go. And as soon as he turned around, he'd shoot him in the back. And this was, you know, he was known for that. I mean, he did that. So there's all kinds of things that went on in those days. I'm going to leave this open to, to questions. Yes. <laughs> Were there any women that were ever kidnapped? And were there any wise guys, women, in that game? Yeah. Actually, the, the women, uh, DeLong's wife and Henry Andrews' wife prepared food for the kidnapping. They actually were in, you know, they were at the kidnap castles where they took these people and, and fed them. They were the people who cooked their meals for them. They were cooked. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The St. Alphonsus that you mentioned, is that the one that's on Warren and Schaefer. East Dearborn? I think it is, yes. Warren and Schaefer. Warren and Schaefer. Is the house still there? 
Yeah. You know, I don't. That's a good question. I, I don't know. It, it could very well be there. Huh. Well, be interesting. How old was Lehman when he died? Seventy-four. Oh. It's interesting because these two ladies are his granddaughters, and they're they're the children of his son, Joseph Lehman. Also, they call the son Legs. Actually, he was a Chicago police officer uh, oh, yeah. for many years. In fact, when I did speak to their father, I said, what did your father think of your job? He said, no, not much. <laughs> uh, of course, Joseph Lehman uh, passed away when he had uh, emphysema. And uh, he smoked about uh, three packs of camels a day. And while he's in the hospital of emphysema, they have a tank, a big oxygen tank there. And it says, do not smoke. Didn't make any difference to him. <laughs> he would smoke. He no, just smoked in that. But he did die of emphysema back in 1970. Well, I'll give you an indication. These, these guys, these, not only the Lehman Gang, but the Detroit underworld in the 20s was serious bad place. I mean, these were bad characters. These guys wouldn't hesitate to kill you at the drop of a hat to walk into a room like this and shoot somebody in front of a hundred witnesses. There, there, there was no sneaking around in the alleys. It was all high-profile cowboy type stuff. They, you know, like I said, the Lehman gang were kidnapping people off their front porch, washing their cars. Uh, there was another gangster that was associated with the Lehman gang named Jimmy Walters. Walters was a very close friend of Legs Lehman. Walters was an Irish mobster that had a blind pig, the Clover Club, and he used to figure wealthy people who would come into his blind pig. Well, Walters was an interesting carrier, just in himself. Walters was born in Corktown in 1897. He served in the uh, 116th Infantry in World War I. He was a hero. This guy came out a sergeant, and uh, around 1920, became a gangster. And actually, in the 20s, he ran with a group called the Bill Morton Gang, which were the major narcotics uh, dealers in the city in the early 20s. Walters always stayed in the narcotics racket, but he owned the Blind Pig, and he was kind of a freelancer. So he sometimes he'd work with the Lehman Gang, fingering people or kidnapping people. But Walters supposedly, he was so feared in the Detroit underworld, this guy, that using his name, saying you were a friend of Walters, would keep stick-up artists away from your blind pig. Detroit was like a freelance place where anybody with a gun that had the guts that wanted to shake somebody down would walk into a blind pig and say, you know what, I want 25% of your business or I'll come in here and kill you or I'll kill your customers. Or, well, they came into Walters' place one day, and two gunmen, so the story goes, and they put their guns on the table and they, they called him over and they said, we want 50% of your business. So he took his gun out, put it on the table. He says, okay, go ahead and take it. And I guess he scared these guys so much they both got up and walked out of his place. <laughs> Walters ended up getting shot to death working on his car in his driveway in 1930 by, I think, mafia people. Walters was in the drug racket. And in 1930, a major diplomatic force in the mafia here in Detroit died in pneumonia, a guy named Sam Catalano. And after that, there was two factions to the, to the mafia here, the east side and the west side mobs, they went to war. Well, anyway, somehow Walters was involved in that because he was muscling in on the drug racket on the east side, and I think that's what happened to him. But uh, each one of these people are stories unto themselves. <coughs> yes? What hospital did Legs die in? Was it in Michigan think, or? Uh, or in Chicago. I think it was... Uh, it was the Cook County Hospital. I think it was the uh, the one over uh, by Old Park and uh, Austin Boulevard. Uh, the the inter interesting thing is he was a numbers runner for a while in Chicago. Now all those old timers knew who he was. I mean, he was a big name in the twenties. All those the Chicago Bob obviously knew who he was, which is kind of interesting because he was always afraid someone was looking for him. Well, I mean. They knew where he was. <laughs> they knew where he on, was. Top of, on top of the fact, he worked for the Ford Service Department after he got out of prison. The whole Ford Service Department was gangsters and ex-communists. So everybody died knew where he was. He died in Chicago? He died in Chicago. Okay. That would have been, what, 74? 74. Yeah. He was uh, 74 is young. 
By today's standards. You know, it's young. Tell I'm me. 82. Well, 74 is not so young, Don, for a guy in his line of work. No, no, you're right. <laughs> he, 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 was, uh, he was an old man. <laughs> anybody, uh, anybody else? Yes, sir. They never went after anybody in the jet, right? Did they ever go after the Ford Motor Company or anything? Well, it's, a good, it's good that you brought up the point. The gang actually was planning on kidnapping the children at Hansel Ford. Wow. They were going to machine gun the guards and just take the kids. Jeez. They never got around to that. But they were in the talking stages of doing whatever yeah, before idea. they shut down the game. <laughs> but you know, Etzel Ford and Henry Ford, the old man, were terrified of the fact. Yeah. They were all, he was always worried about his the grandchildren being kidnapped. So there was actually a plan in the works, but they didn't operate long enough to actually make it happen. That's, Do you know anything about the, uh, there's a structure out on, I think it was Seven Mile and uh, was it Seven Mile and what well, was the uh, Northville uh, Golf Club? I've it, heard. I've heard the people, big old structure. People have asked me that. Before. Yeah. Do you know anything? No, about not it? specifically. Supposedly, it was associated, I think, with the Purple Gang, but other. I've other heard that too. I've heard that. It may, it may very well have been. Okay. Uh, I've, I've often been asked about Purple Gang hideouts in Michigan. They, they were all over Michigan. So if you knew enough about it, you could actually, you could probably write another book about it. But I mean, how do you, you know, you ever, have you ever noticed that, you know, they got an old bar downtown and they say Purple Gang used to hang out? Yeah. There? How do you prove it? How do you know yeah. that? Yeah. You know, yeah, maybe they did. Who knows? But I, Probably I, did it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that gang, was, uh, well, wasn't that primarily a Jewish gang? Predom predominantly. Predominantly Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. But prior to 1920, most organized crime in the United States was Irish and Jewish. Okay. Yeah. The Italians came later. Came later. They worked for the Jews. Yeah. Okay. In the early days. <clears throat> yes. Where did Harry, Bear and Harry Bennett come from? Harry Bennett was, uh, he was hired by old man Ford in New York in 1918 or 1919. He, 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 I don't know, he got... He, Either beat somebody up that was giving the old man a hard time or something. Yeah, and yeah. He decided was, he was that he, on, uh, yeah, he decided he was supposedly a, a boxer in the Navy. He wasn't big, but he no, was. No, he was he's supposed to be tough. So I guess Henry Ford thought he could use him for something. Well, he said, like, if he had five Henry <coughs> Bennett's, he could, could have uh, taken care of Hitler. <laughs> well, yeah, that's, that's, that's saying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I think Harry. I think Harry Bennett was more impressed with himself than he really. You know, I don't. I don't know how much. And he had a place out on the Rouge River, right? With yeah, the, he did. With the boathouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he used to walk around the plant with a lion. He had a pet yeah. lion. Yeah, yeah, he, was, yeah, yeah. he was a real, really, really into this whole macho thing. He had a pet lion. Yeah. Pet lion. <laughs> yes, Where do you do most of your research on this kind of stuff? Where Every, everywhere. But a lot of the research I did that I. Uh, by the way, I do have a number of copies of The Violent Years if anybody's interested uh, after this lecture. Uh, I've done research literally everywhere, but most of this stuff was local. Uh, so I, I was fortunate enough to get into the Detroit Police Department when they still had some stuff left years ago. And I did some research there, but a lot of it is, is newspapers, uh, court records, that kind of stuff. A lot of, a lot of well, as everybody here knows, a lot of history is speculation. It's hypothesis, you know. Yeah. And you go by, you know, the preponderance of evidence, and you, you know, you try and put it together the best you can. So I have a question. Yeah. How big was the Lakes Linden gang? Probably 20 people altogether, which isn't real big, as far as, as far as an organized crime group. But yeah, probably 20. But they did all operate together. They operated in bits like. Legs Lehman operated with Henry Andrews and, and a couple other guys, and then some of the other guys did their own thing. And he, as I say, those two gunmen, Wiles and Hoffer, they did whatever they felt like doing. So everybody kind of did whatever. It wasn't wasn't organized like you think of was Italian organized. Was it more organized. like they were just allies? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Business partners, but loose business partners. Yeah. Yeah, professional relationships. <laughs> yeah, right. professional. That's right. But like I said, I can't emphasize enough how wild Detroit was in the 20s. It was a wild, wild place. And I think worse than Chicago or New York. They didn't get the same press. But, uh, so how did it all get changed? How did it all turn around? 
Well, I think after, you know, Prohibition came to an end and the Great Depression, right. and I think that gangsters weren't, you know, during the, during the 20s, during the Prohibition era, gangsters sort of became social pets, especially rum runners and bootleggers and, and, and purple gangsters and guys who made the pen lines every day and guys who went to the ball games and, and had their own boxes and wore fancy clothes and people thought, wow, look at those guys, you know. Right. But uh, I think that with the Depression, I think that the gangland hits and those kind of things, people didn't have the tolerance for them that they did prior to, you know, the Great Depression. Things were tough. And after Prohibition, all these gangsters got into different lines of work if they stayed in underworld stuff, labor racketeering, you know, other forms of extortion, gambling. Okay, so the need wasn't there? No. Okay. No. Well, kidnapping is a, is, that's a real risky way to make a living. I mean, they thought, they thought that it, you know, it wasn't really, they thought it was good. And I, in a way, it was good when they were kidnapping other gangsters, but when they were kidnapping legitimate people, people aren't going to tolerate that too long. How many times did they kidnap legitimate people before the case? Well, they had 14, they had 14 kidnappings on the record of recorder's court. Oh, okay. That's just part of it. They might have kidnapped 100 people. But they had 14, 14 cases that they figured, and what they did is they just had them on the docket. So if they brought Henry Andrews in, in one case, if he wasn't testifying, if he, if he didn't turn state's witness, if they brought him in one, it was like the Holdreth kidnapping, and they were charging him with that, and uh, they couldn't get a, uh, you know, they got an acquittal or, or a hung jury or whatever, they charged them with something else. So they were just going to keep charging these guys until they got them convicted of something. How big were drugs in the 20s? Not, not as big as they are today, but still considerably. You know, it wasn't, alcohol was the drug of the 20s. <clears throat> but, but opium was very popular. In fact, there were opium dens all over the city. There was even an opium den across the street from Detroit Police Headquarters. <laughs> so everybody was on somebody's payroll in those days. And I don't really think, I mean, I'm sure a lot of this goes on today, too. It's just under the radar now. Right. But in those days, uh, for an example, uh, uh, Henry Garvin, who was head of the Crime and Bomb Squad, which was like the organized crime task force of the 20s here in Detroit, he was on the Purple Gang's payroll the whole time the gang was in power, literally. For four yeah. or five years. In fact, if they had people who complained about money getting extorted from them, they say, "Well, you want to go down and make a complaint with, uh, you know, Inspector Garvin?" And on their payroll, <laughs> call himself the nemesis of Purple Gang, and everybody in the city was common knowledge on the street that he did business with the Purple Gang. So did a lot of judges too, mm -hmm. didn't they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. See, that's the key. I think that's one of the most important things. Not so much about the Lehman Gang, but about some of the other organized crime groups. Prohibition really turned it all around. These guys, prior to Prohibition, sometimes in, in, in cities that had ward politics, like New York, they worked for the politicians. They were allowed to do whatever they were going to do as long as they were available on election day to make sure that the votes went for the right candidate. But I think after that, you know, Prohibition flipped the whole thing around. Now these people were rich. They were buying judges. They were buying political protection. You know, it really changed the whole scope of organized crime in this country. See, Kwame wasn't so bad. <laughs> Small potatoes. <laughs> I, I remember one of these lectures, you said you had given a lecture, and after the lecture, a priest came up to you and asked you, said, sounds like you admire these. No, people. yeah, that was, it was actually a minister at Birmingham uh, yeah. uh, Congregational Church. It was a sit-down dinner for like 200 people, and I gave a lecture on the Purple Gang, and he said, yeah, he, he is exactly what he said, which I thought was kind of inappropriate. Because everybody kind of really enjoyed the lecture. I said, no, I don't admire these guys. I admire the guys who didn't take money. Anybody could take money. The ones you got to admire are the ones that weren't corruptible, because if there weren't people like that, the whole thing would have turned into a jungle. Yeah, yeah so he did say that. What would make him think that? I don't know. Because you're interested in Because I was interested yeah. in the subject, and I was talking. Not even that I was interested in the subject, that everybody was enjoying it. <laughs> and you know, you're not supposed to enjoy it. You didn't like that. I mean, I don't, I, I think that any, I think that any crime historian that starts to glamorize these guys doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand the history, he doesn't understand these people. There's nothing glamorous about this lifestyle, to me. I'd rather be a white collar criminal if I was going to be a criminal. Yeah. <laughs> these guys make money that makes these guys dwarfs, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be a fun they, go I mean, they talk about stuff like the Lufthansa robbery. So it was seven, six or seven million dollars. That's peanuts. These guys at Enron, what did they walk off into the sunset? Yeah. <clears throat> Enron. 
the hedge managers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't go to prison. No, and they don't have anybody chasing them. Right. <clears throat> Nobody shooting. Yeah. Nobody shooting. Yeah. That's right. Anybody else? I've forgotten about it until you just mentioned it, Ron. I've forgotten about that. I don't have anything to say yet. There, there are games today. I mean, we know that. You read it in the papers. You know, some of the newer ethnic groups that are coming in. But it seems to me they're kind of sloppy. Well, I don't know. Uh, I mean... I don't know. Compared no, I, to the, the previous. <coughs> no, I don't. You know, I, I I don't really agree with that. It seems like that sometimes, but you mean like drug gangs? Yeah. Like young boys or they're or shooting something. everything up and. Well, these, these guys these were doing guys the same too. thing. <laughs> yeah, but but the, the ones today, it's like they 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 don't care if they're shooting up a bunch of legitimate people. Yeah. Most people didn't care. They, they, they didn't care either. Yeah. You know. Now, if somebody happened to get in the way, yeah, too bad. Too bad. You shouldn't have been there. No. I don't think it's, I think it's more in your face now. I think the yeah. media is more in your face now, but I don't think it's any different. Yeah. I mean, there were drive by shootings before there were drive by <laughs> shootings, there were horse by shootings. And those, I think actually it's more, it's more, uh, I, I mean, like drug gangs. The different ethnic groups and drug gangs in Detroit. I think it's more under the under the under the carpet than the stuff that these guys did in the 20s was high profile, right in your face. Well, do they keep it like in their own neighborhood? I mean, do the, currently today they're, they're still all over. <coughs> the, the violence might be in that in the neighborhood because that's where the where the turf wars are. But <coughs> I mean, there's no turf war in Birmingham. So Detroit Not that drug we know. Not that we, but if there is, it could happen there. Do you have the drug uh, problem on the wars between gangs in this area like we have in Chicago? Oh, yeah. That's everywhere. I mean, shootings. Uh, everywhere. It's just so much money. That's good. <coughs> Almost every day you're reading a newspaper on TV that, you know, they're shooting. But you know what? They're missing the people that are shooting. They're shooting innocent kids and that on the street. But that's, yeah. I think you hear more about it now, but in one way or another, it was always going on. Just have better weapons now, and more news coverage. And yeah, more news coverage. The technology. Yeah, the technology. It's in our living room. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you're, you know, I mean, everybody always, you know, everybody always thinks of the, of the classical gangster, the original gangster with the Thompson submachine gun. Right. They hardly ever use them. The weapon of choice in the 20s was a 32 caliber automatic or a small caliber pistol. You shot somebody in the back of the head in the car. Yeah. Yes. Do you think there'll be any uh, decrease in uh, drug crime if cannabis is legalized? Yeah, I mean, it is some. some. They ought to legalize all of it, I think. Well, there's no black market, there's no crime. They're exactly. not going to be involved in it. Nobody's going to be involved. No money. Yeah, that's true. It's like Willie Sutton, who was a career bank robber, said, you know, rob yeah. banks because that's where the money that's is. That's where the money is. That's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, um, it's, not federally legal. I don't understand how. States no, but I mean, I think I think that if they government. I think that if they if they regulated drugs in this country, I yeah. mean, all drugs, heroin, <coughs> cocaine, whatever, if it was regulated, yeah, I would eliminate the black market to to a great extent, not completely, but I think there's too many people making money on drugs in this country, legitimate people too, not just gangsters. I just don't understand. Um, like there's some people that want to be able to grow up like California. They want to, because of the cannabis oil is supposed to be good for seizure. A lot of yeah, like, yeah, that I don't know. know. But but people, if they were doing that, they could still get in trouble with the federal government. So what would have to happen in order that there wouldn't people wouldn't be prosecuted for growing? Legalize it, regulate it. The federal government. Yeah. Okay. But then, well, the, like well, Colorado, why is there two they're make, I know what you're saying. Why like in Colorado, they're sure. making so much money, um, you know, with um, sure, yeah. the other states are going like this. I don't oh, think the yeah, feds are really that. that interested, you know. Be eventually, it's my feeling that it's going to probably be legal, yeah. like throughout the I mean, and maybe at, at the fed level, though, they're going to change all that. Plus, you know, people that are employed in DEA. <laughs> well, so, oh, 
<laughs> their major employer. About that. It's going to happen to all those jobs. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, <clears throat> that's a really good question. It's a single thought. Confusion. Schneider won't like confusion that. Confusion uh, that criminals could make it fault. You know. It's a, you know it just depends. Whatever whatever's profitable Without is what thing. organized crime people are going to be involved with. If it's drugs, you know, like I said, during the 20s, the drug of choice, well, you know, people smoked opium. But the major money-making drug was alcohol. Mm -hmm. Any kind of In alcohol Michigan. you can get your hands on. In Michigan, though, they were saying how, how the drug trafficking is just getting worse and worse. Probably. And you wouldn't think that. Because <coughs> they're cleaning up Detroit, and so it's like, because no. everybody associates that with being the problem, the whole problem in Michigan. That's all over the state, though. That's so. not just... People are kidding themselves when they say there's so much money in the drug. There's so much money in illegal drugs, and there's so much money in that business that that money they can bribe. <coughs> you can't. No organized crime group can operate a week without official protection. They can't do it. They can't continue continue to operate. You could buy a lot of people with billions of dollars. So you don't think that crime will in, increase or decrease? I could crack. Crime will always be with us, and then we're always going to have some black market commodity that people are going to make money. Selling, whether it's drugs or alcohol or just as a high school kid, they'll tell you where it's <laughs> at. Tell you where it's at. Yes, I understand that these legal marijuana places, out of whatever they're called, where they can sell it legally, mm -hmm. I understand That's that they got a real problem um, because they can't put their money in the bank because that'll leave a paper trail that the feds can follow. The IRS is a problem. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. a real problem. So <laughs> they're, cash they're, being, they're having to hire yeah. all cash. Yeah, sure. So it is. They're having to hire muscle to protect them because they're dealing in cash. Yep. They're burying it in cans yeah, or something. Cash. Sure. Mm -hmm. You can't take it to the bank. No, you sure can't. But you During Prohibition, were any gangsters in Detroit oh, involved oh, with oh, the oh, Walker oh, family oh, in Windsor? Right. I'm sure they were. I think the Purple Gang was involved with some of the Canadian uh, distilleries. <coughs> those Canadian distilleries made a small fortune to bankroll Prompman and some of those other Canadian distillery dynasties in Canada. Because during Prohibition, you know, alcohol was prohibited in the United States. The Ontario, Ontario the province of Ontario had a, 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 a prohibition law in the 20s, just like we did, except you could, you could manufacture and export liquor, as long as it wasn't going to the United States. So if you came across in a rowboat and they asked you what your destination was, and you said Cuba, they'd say all you wanted. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> looked. You know, you <laughs> Everybody was making money. Everybody was... <coughs> what was the population of Detroit back then? Almost about a million, eight, 800,000. So, kind of like, what percentage was solid? Tiny, tiny percent. It was the criminal side? Tiny percent. I mean, unless you want to call everybody who, who sold booze or ran, ran illegal liquor a criminal. I mean, they were a criminal according to the feds. <coughs> there are lots of people who did that on a very small scale. But any of the big time people were in these crime groups. It just sounds like it was such a dangerous place to live. But just it dangerous that you ended up getting caught in the crossfire somewhere. I'm glad I live in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Chicago even scared Lucky Luciano. They went there for a meeting in 1933, and he says, a scary place. Nobody's safe on the street. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think will happen with uh, Cuba since uh, their relations with the U.S.? I don't family. know. I think they already sent all the gangsters here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they cleaned up their jails. <laughs> <laughs> They're all in Miami. Anybody else? Rob? Like I said, I do have a quantity of violent years if anybody's interested.